Welcome back. I hope you got some refreshments because this panel is going to be a spicy one. We're going to be talking about data culture and uh, data literacy, the soft uh, values, uh, but the important values, and uh, a topic that a lot of people have been asking a lot of questions on. They have a lot of uh, practical concerns, I think. So I think we're going to dive straight into it, but we have a, a very good panel here of esteemed guests. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Steve Neat. I'm the general manager uh, for Alation in EMEA. Awesome. Mike Palmer, I'm the CEO of Sigma Computing. Okay. Hi, I'm Eva Murray. I'm lead evangelist at Snowflake. Okay. Dan Sommer, senior director of market intelligence at Click. Okay. All right, so we have a good spread here. A, a bit, a bit of uh, technology representation, a bit of uh, vendor representation, and uh, uh, um, entrepreneurs. And uh, we, we've been talking about uh, data culture and data literacy earlier in the day uh, from the perspective of some uh, movements like data mesh and other things that are happening now. And um, when, we t when I talk about data literacy as a data, sci data scientist that's trying to help people understand what's possible with AI, there's a strong analogy here in uh, the internet revolution where now we understand it as a communication medium but in the early 2000s, people thought of the internet as web pages. And I think there's something similar now with AI where people have a hard time conceptualizing what it really means. And they have these examples of it, you know, the Siri maybe, uh, cat and dog classifiers. And it's hard to be creative when you don't have, you know, vocabulary of examples and experience and that kind of thing. Where does this journey start? Do you, do you, are you on a journey, or, or, and, and what do people that you interact with, how, how do they experience it? Well, I think, firstly, I like to try and define what data culture is. Mm. I think many people talk about it. Organizations aspire to it, but I think lots of people have different definitions of what a data culture is. And I think, for me, it's about empowering and enabling everybody in a company to make informed, good decisions based on data. Uh, and that has many facets. It's, it's about availability of data, about people being capable, having the context and understanding about how to use it, and some of the tools to help them. I think what's really important is data culture is not just a, a nice to have, because there's increasing evidence I believe that there's a link between having a data culture and the performance of a business. I know Bain did some good work around that to say, if you have a data culture, you're twice as likely to be in the upper quartile in terms of performance. So data culture is more of a, a, a business imperative now, not just a nice to have. Uh, and I think if we start from that premise that if you can build a data culture, it impacts your business, then you're going to get the stakeholder support. The executives are going to support it and desire it because they're expecting some really strong business outcomes. But let me ask you, because you're in that position, is data culture something that's top down or bottom up? Oh, I think, I think you probably need both, but you <laughs> absolutely do need uh, strong sponsorship. Okay. If you don't have that, it's hard work from the bottom up, right. I believe. And you need to link it to some important, uh, compelling imper imperatives and strategic initiatives in the company. It just doesn't happen by itself. Right. But if you have strong stakeholder support, you're more likely to achieve it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, do you I, think, I, I would <coughs> say, do you feel that? Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, that's a great question if it's top down or bottom up. I think it, it needs to be both, frankly. Uh, top down because Roles like the CDO, for example, can really influence you know, where we take data and link it to strategic imperatives, like you said. But then it's, it's equally important to sort of foster an organic culture bottom up. And, and you can't just sort of dump it all on the sort of senior executives. It needs to happen organically as well because much of the accidental innovation is, is happening bottom up in the fringes of organizations. So that needs to be supported as well. Right. 
Well, then the question is, is, is data culture uh, something that's unique per company, or are we talking about like best practices? What, what's your experience? Yeah, I'd say there's common elements definitely across different organizations and how their data <laughs> culture will look. And for me, it's much about the attitude people have towards data and how they use it, and that they use it for decision making, and that there's a willingness to learn, to learn the tools, to learn, become data literate, to learn about statistics and how everything hangs together. And, but also the, you know, what's the direction, like where is the company going with data? And I think the unique applications within an organization, that's then the secret source. That is how you lift the data culture into a competitive advantage and into something that sets you apart. And that could be fostering a great internal community of data scientists or data engineers and giving them the ability to really excel in their jobs and to drive innovation and to let them shine. And that again then attracts not just customers but also other people. So I think you take common elements of what you need to really make data work internally and that is probably going to be very similar across organizations but then make it unique to drive that competitive advantage. Right. Well, I mean, I guess every company is unique. They do d unique business, but but there are some best practices, evidently, or at least commonalities between the companies. What have you seen these types of commonalities? What what kinds of things are common across companies that do uh, that have a good data culture? And and I'll change your word commonalities just to say behaviors, because it's easy to talk about culture, but culture is meaningless, really. Mm -hmm. I, when you describe somebody's culture, ultimately, you're describing what behavior do they witness on a day-to-day -day basis. What they're doing in practice. What do they do, right? Uh, you are what you eat, you know, in some respects, right? So I, mean, I think, for me, what a data culture is actually is quite simple. You know, number one is, when you show up to a meeting at our company and you're asked a question, do you answer with a number first or an explanation? Mm. You can always explain the number, but it has to start with a number. If you're asked mm. a data question, can you answer it on the spot or not? Or do you take an action item, go away, and come back to a meeting in a week or so and, and update it? The third would be, am I using live actual data or am I presenting you something from yesterday? Because if a company is going to have a high velocity decision making process, uh, if they're going to have a, a more accurate decision making process, then they're going to be using data that's true at this very second and not data that was extracted, put into some sort of graphical format, slapped into a PowerPoint presentation, finished yesterday if you're lucky and then show up in the meeting today. That's yesterday's business. Uh, so I mean, it, those are very measurable things. <laughs> if you're not doing them, you're probably not in the top quartile of companies. Well, I think a lot of people are going to have a knee-jerk reaction and be like, uh, you know, not everything is measurable. You can't do that. Uh, but um, I think it's hard to measure progress without measuring something at all. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people think of data as like a byproduct of day-to-day -day operations. <clears throat> but there's an element of, you know, you said start with a number. If the number doesn't exist, is part of data culture also creating data culture or just looking at what exists? I think it's, it's both what, what exists and having a common understanding of what exists. Mm. Uh, because I think you know, you've got to be able to trust the data mm. that, that exists as well. And, and all believe that the data's, data is right. If you, ha if, you ha if you have data that you can't trust, then how can you believe that you're making good decisions which will result in good outcomes. So I think that level of trust is really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there are gaps, then you need some way of, of defining what you're looking for. It might be the, the, the definition of a KPI or a metric, but you need some mechanism to ensure you have a common understanding. You need to understand, you need to be sure you know where it comes from and that that source is, is trusted and you need to know whether it's transformed and changed and put into PowerPoint, put into several spreadsheets and manipulated. Yeah. So it's all about trust, I think. Common understanding and trust. <clears throat> then you can make trusted, informed business decisions to support your initiatives. Let me ask, I think that's a great, great question for us to stick around on, uh, 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 circle, circle around on once, is the trust issue. Um, I think that's one, a sticking point that a lot of people get caught up on and they say we can't move on with our AI initiatives because we can't trust the data. Is there a threshold that you can cross where you know you trust it 70% and you're willing to move on? And I think maybe just to sort of put that in context, uh, you know, before you're systematic about it, if you're trusting people, you're already sort of doing that kind of trust where you know people yeah. aren't infallible. But do you feel that there is, uh, 
you can get going before you reach perfection or like you know yeah. how do you decide where that cutoff even is so uh, uh, that, that's that's a great question and I want to tie it to the, the commonality question that you spoke about earlier I, I think um, <laughs> You know, it obviously depends on industry, different industries. There are some industries where if you don't have perfectly accurate information, your CFO is going to go to prison. Uh, but in general, uh, going to those commonalities for driving a data culture, I think like veering on the side of more trust and uh, allowing more um, proliferation of information to the uh, employees in the organization tends to have more data culture, more data literacy, if people can sort of do rapid prototyping and experiment, even if the data isn't perfectly accurate. And to your point, sometimes you need to shine a light on the data uh, to find uh, the data quality errors rather than just sort of hiding it in a basement that no one can ever see it. So I think that's one of those commonalities I see very often that if you're veering on more on the side of allowing people to access data and trust them to do the right thing, then you have more successful organizations. Right, yeah, and that's something we do see a lot, that, that, that problems in data are never surfaced unless right. you do try to use it for something and then discover it's not good because it didn't have you know, the, the right prerequisites and that kind of thing. Yeah. Is that a part of, uh, is that, uh, I want to tie it back to the question I had before about whether that's a top-down approach or whether it's an engineering uh, issue. I mean, everybody says, you know, we have these uh, initiatives going and we can't get started until we're done cleaning the data. And I think they tend to be treated more as an engineering problem than a business problem. In your experience, do you know, are those business discussions or are those engineers out we're looking at the missing values and uh, whatnot? So, so I would love for the engineers to talk to the business. And one example that I love bringing up in this context is when I moved to the UK, I got a phone contract for my cell phone and I was sitting in the store and I was giving them my address, you know, the essentials for the contract, and they had to ask me all these other questions, but you could tell the salesperson didn't really want me to sit there for half an hour answering questions to fill in. So he just put dummy values in, and I sat there thinking, oh my God, the poor data engineer that has to clean up this data. Why can't the store people have a feedback to whoever created the form and say, this is not a good customer experience, mm. and why can't the data engineer say, who created this data, and let me understand why there's all these dummy values or these wrong values, and they can come up with a solution together of, what's the minimum viable amount of information we need legally to create this contract, and mm. can we then send an email to the customer offering them a 10 pound discount on their next bill in exchange for more information because if I as the customer fill in the data, it's probably going to be accurate because I can you know, spell my address more correctly and all that stuff and I'm willing to do this in exchange for a token amount of money or so. And I think we have many disconnects because the people or the parts of the data value chain are so far removed from one another now. So who are the people and the processes creating that data that is comes up as having lots of errors? Yeah. And how can we fix that so that it doesn't need to be constantly repaired and cleaned, but rather we create it right in the first place and we optimize those business processes so they work for the people at the front line. There's a great point here, and I definitely agree with your point about does the and it's unfortunate we talk about the technical teams and the business teams as if, in theory, they're different, but they're not, right? They, they're all working for one company that's trying to do whatever it is that that company does. Um, I'm going to tie it back to your first question, though. The more we talk about AI, the more we've given an opportunity for one profile of user to go off in one direction, which is highly technical and, frankly, a mystery to the vast majority of the other people, while the vast majority of the other people are stuck with the same process they've used for the last 40 years. And to your point, if we spent more time trying to bring these two groups together, we'd make far more practical progress you know, in terms of the mm -hmm. business's ability to use data, mm -hmm. that we know that the data is accurate, that it's useful for people making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And yes, of course, we can pursue uh, our AI initiatives, but if the foundation between these two groups is weak, there's no success for the AI either because this group of yeah. people will reject it. Yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of creating data, and I think one thing that you know, ties uh, uh, together the two things that you guys were speaking about is uh, the customer satisfaction. Is that measurable? Can we tie that back in? Is that a data source? Who is the and, customer? Uh, no, well like the person, uh, you know, you're filling in the form and obviously you think that it was a bad experience and so you've made this service 
and you have no way of measuring whether the service is performing as intended. And if you ask the engineer, they'll be like, yeah, well it is, because it has 99, nine, five nines of uptime. But that's not what, nobody measures that. That's, nobody cares about that. You, yeah. And so you should be collecting data on how it's performing for the business, and that's data. But that's like non-functional data, as it's called, or, or yeah, and so telemetry data. Yeah. So um, I'm wondering, uh, in terms of if when we can shift this to data literacy now, these these concepts are maybe well established in software engineering. You know, the idea of having domain requirements, non-functional requirements, requirements, and, and or you know, you have feature freezes, uh, sprints. These concepts now that every company is becoming a, a data company whether they think of the, you know, you make intelligent decisions, you're, you're a software company, a data company, they're still pretty foreign concepts. And um, I'm wondering, you know, for you for example, do, do, you, do you talk about it as if they're well-established software engineering principles or are these new and novel things that you need to introduce slowly or how, uh, how do you speak about them? Well, I think, you know, to drive data literacy um, and build that data culture, um, having, having some feedback from the applications that tells you what data's important so that the engineers and the business can focus on. And, and also perhaps, who are your top users? So what's really important? Otherwise you have this minefield, uh, you can't see the wood for the trees. You've got all of this data, too much data. And for the business and engineers to know what's important is really critical. Too much irrelevant data, not enough relevant data. <laughs> and how do you how do you figure it out? Yeah. How do you work out which is which? Yeah. What's important to the business? So you do need business engagement to give you that direction, but also some feedback from your systems, your architecture to say, well actually, this is really what's being used. Yeah. I, I have this great analogy which is was a eureka moment when I started cycling a couple of years ago. Um, where I started using Strava, and Strava would help me uh -huh. plan, plan my routes based upon the anonymized, aggregated activity of others. And if we apply that sort of consumer experience to the enterprise to give feedback that this is what's important, and it may not be 100% accurate, but it might be good enough in certain circumstances. It might need to be 100% accurate for, in a regulated sense, but for others, it's good enough. But as long as the engineers and the business have a common understanding of what the quality level is, and they have the literacy yeah. to recognize what that means, mm. then I think you can, it's valuable. It's valuable to the business to help them make those informed and trusted decisions. Yeah. So no, there's too much data, none of it's perfect, and we have to live with that and have tools that help you, I think, yeah. discern what's good enough to help you be in that upper quartile. Yeah. And on the data literacy side, and to your point as well, and the discussion around business versus tech, it seems like the most valuable roles that are emerging right now in organizations are the hybrid roles that can do both. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of talk right now about the analytic engineer, for example, or uh, the citizen data scientists, or uh, there are other roles out there as well, and especially, you know, like data storytellers, for example, having this sort of social skills to be able to interpret the data and communicate that. Those are some of the most valuable roles. Some people call them data translators as well. Mm -hmm. So everything is kind of meshing together, and hopefully that's going to sort of straddle the different kind of silos between different parts of the organization. I wonder what you think, <coughs> um, you know, everybody now is familiar with the capabilities of the internet, both because we are more familiar with the technology, but also because we have tens of examples for any one business you can think of, whether it's banking or entertainment or gaming or whatever, you can probably say, give me 10 examples of companies that are entirely founded on the internet and have that as the backbone of their service, but we can't come up with examples of that when it comes to AI or similar modern technologies. How important is it for uh, data literacy that people take these, you know, get better at AI courses, you know, learn how to do linear regression and that kind of stuff. Do you feel that those have an effect or are, or are we, or is that too level, low level? Where, like, what is a good starting point? Well, I think data literacy is so many things to so many different people. There certainly is that element, uh, but if you're going to found a company based on it, it's probably too specialized. I think the at, the, at least when I look at data literacy, it's more like 
well, there's the activists, as I call it, which are the highly specialized engineers, analysts, uh, data scientists, mm. AI folks, etc. There should be specialized learning for them, but I think the key thing is to lift sort of the, the masses in an organization so that they understand the basics, like yeah. correlation versus causation, which is a whole different ball game. Uh, than what you're talking about. I think 90% well, yeah. let, let, Let's make this practical. Like if we talk about the uh, brick and mortar houses of the late 90s uh, and you told them that people wanted to buy online, they'd be like, you can't even try the clothes on. Why would you buy it online? And, and through data literacy, people realize, well, we can communicate, we can do smart things. And now with, with, um, with this kind of stuff, I, I think it's the same thing where you might want to educate them in what AI can potentially do to help their existing retail businesses. But it's not clear to me if the, you know, an introduction to linear regression is the right way to go. I mean, statistics is, is no joke. Most statisticians don't get statistics. And like causation and, and correlation, um, there's lots of neat stuff to be said about that as well. But, it, but is that too low level to, when we're talking, I mean, li data literacy, what are we actually talking that about? That is too you low know, level. You guys are talking about yeah. that there's many different definitions, but what, what is the ambition? Where should we be landing? That's too low level. We'll just, so there isn't, every single successful company since the time frame that you've started found a way to simplify technology. If you go back to the 90s, at the, you anchored your, uh, your example in the 90s. Every single technology company had professional services, they had certification programs, they even give you like four letter designations of how specialized you really are. Mm. And you can't find one of them today. Nobody builds a large company trying to create specialists. And so when we're looking at having to build skills in statistics or skills in Python or skills in writing R, uh, we're going in the wrong direction, right? That's not the direction the world has gone. When these technologies become simple enough that normal people can use them, then they will make a difference in the businesses, but not until then. So in the meantime, they're incubating and they won't have a major impact on most businesses, not to say all. We should focus more on the millions and millions of people who are still acting like 1985 right. that are running most businesses today than the very small number of people who will do a, a linear regression uh, done out of Python connected to a database that most people don't have access to. Mm. You'd be very lucky to get a significant impact out of that group. All these certifications are about that kind of stuff, learning about statistics and that kind of thing. I think the kind of grip that we have of the internet now is you know, we understand that you can get a notification asynchronously on the phone. Nobody knows the routing protocols that actually have to, you know, work for that to happen. But you understand the idea that things don't have to happen at the same time. Uh, we, we can send data in both directions. You know, sort of these overarching principles. And maybe there are similar overarching data and AI principles. Uh, and the question is, is it better to educate people in those principles? Or is it only through seeing examples because sometimes when, when you show examples, if it's not exactly the example in that industry and it's exactly the same, they're like, yeah, I don't see how this has to do with banking. If this is retail, it's not the same thing. And it's like, it is the same thing, but maybe that's only obvious to an engineer. Well, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, one of our customers, the very group, I, I watched a video of their CEO talking about their business mm. and the new distribution center. But he said one of their strategic assets was the behavioral data of their four million customers that they'd accumulated over 120 years. The behavioral data. So you have a CEO who's sensitive to, one, I've got behavioral data. Two, it's a strategic asset to the business. Mm. And for me, it kind of starts there. If you've got a senior sponsor who gets the value of data, yeah. it's going to permeate the rest of the organization. Yeah. So the rest of the organization that will then understand the value, they make the right sort of investments in training, in tools, in capabilities mm. to extract the value. Yeah. So I look at it from the top down, yeah. predominantly to see if the sponsorship is there, yeah. the will and desire is there. Yeah. And yes, they want to get everything they can out of AI and advanced reporting and all of those shiny good things, mm. but they can't do it without trusted data right. as the foundation. Mm -hmm. I'd love to add a little bit more on the education question yeah. you had, because I think having done statistics at university through my psychology degree, what I learned was really valuable and really helpful, but it was so long ago. 
And at that point, there was no connection between what I learned at university and what I could be doing in business. Mm. And I think if we can bridge that gap between academia and the real business world so that people maybe stick with the subject for longer and have stronger foundations, because you said it's not enough to just learn linear regression. And I learned linear regression. This was 15 years ago. How am I supposed to remember unless I apply it? And I think what we also need to appreciate is that's going to be the job of a fairly small number of people because the masses need a lower level of understanding just to get started with data. And I think it comes from both sides. You need the organization to make the education available in whatever form, but you also need people to want to learn. And I had a conversation earlier with someone around data democratization, and it comes like normal democracy with civic rights and civic duties. So we need people to take responsibility for their learning of data um, so that when they get that access, they are responsible with what they do with it. They know how to treat the data so that even if we only have 80% confidence in the data being accurate, they're not going to mess it up and, and create results that are kind of scary to work with. And I think that's really important to to make people understand it's not just the duty of the organization to give you access to data and give you training, but for you to also take the opportunity and learn and educate yourself. And I think we saw that, what, 15 years ago, people were promoting their Microsoft Office skills on a CV. Today, you kind of laugh about that because you think, well, that's a given. I just expect yeah. that when you walk through the door. And I think we'll see that in about a decade with the basic data skills. Like, yeah. we need everyone to have them because mm -hmm. otherwise, you're not going to be successful in your job. Oh, for sure. I mean, so you true. see people in society being left behind if they don't use the internet. Like, you can't do banking and other stuff if you don't have yeah. that. And I think in the professional world, if you don't have a basic grasp of statistics, maybe now you can get along, but yeah. you know, in 20 years, you're going to be left behind for serious. And, yeah, and I think to, to build on that, I mean, I saw this great statistic. Like, in the 1920s, only about 35% of the world population was literate. Mm. But then when we moved from agriculture into factories, into the service economy, you couldn't do your job properly if you weren't literate. And I think that's what we're kind of seeing just to sort of beat that horse to death completely with data literacy right now. Uh, it's, so when we're measuring it, uh, roughly 35% of people self-describe themselves as data literate today. So we may see a very similar sort of trajectory as with literacy, with data literacy right now. And I'd, I'd say that the pandemic actually helped uncover that a bit because yeah. <laughs> suddenly everyone in the population was presented with charts and you can either learn how to read them and understand and interpret them or you just take them at face value and you might panic yeah. justifiably or not um, and it's not and it's not just I think the biggest risk isn't that people then don't understand it for themselves is that they share it with their thousands of friends and followers yeah. with the wrong message because they didn't understand it. And I think if we can get people to look at a chart and not just say yes or let's share with everyone, but actually does that look about right? Yes. And to go in and just check a couple of things to make sure they think this is actually the truth and they kind of question things before they share them, I think that's yeah. going to be a massive step to prevent some of the you know misinformation and then the the results we see in society. It was really interesting. I think our politicians were saying, you know, they share data every night on the pandemic and say, we're going to make decisions based upon data as though that was a new concept. Yeah, yeah. it's true. I, I think the metaphors are useful. We talk a lot about, and data for me is a lot like communications. And if you go back to the same time frame, yeah. and to spin it from literacy, because I think that's a, it can be a little bit of a loaded term, right? And just talk about access, right? People started to go to schools. We started to create yeah. publicly accessible schools rather than ones that were funded or, you know, or funded by the family and maybe they couldn't afford to do that. If you go back to that same time frame, if your company and my company were gonna communicate, I'd walk up to somebody and, and dictate a letter. Typing was a skill. Yeah. How many times were we gonna share the letter? Went into the, and you know, in my case, I guess the US Postal Service, but you know, here, you know, post then. And mm -hmm. how, how many of those could I do a day? You know, 20, 30, 40? How many communications did you send in the last hour via Slack, email, text? There was never a lack of demand to communicate, nor do I think there's a lack of demand to use data. There's a lack of access. Mm -hmm. And when we take away the barriers, curiosity will prevail. Yeah. They won't have to ask the machine to tell them what they should be curious about relative to their user experience. They'll find something, then they'll ask, well, if that's true, what about this and this? 
And both of those questions will spawn four more questions, which will spawn 16 more questions. That flow of curiosity mm -hmm. is what is prevented by tech today. But th there's two outputs, and this is neat. So you, what you've identified here is two potential outputs. One is increasing the efficiency of existing operations by, by making decisions better, yeah. better informed decisions. Yeah. And then there is uh, an entrepreneurial aspect of it where the neatest thing, and one of the reasons I think data literacy is super important, is a lot of the greatest ideas come from people that are on the ground, in touch with what's actually going on, and yeah. they can come back and say, you know what, I, I was at this presentation and I learned that in principle with an AI that can study the stuff, it should be able to learn this. Can't we turn that into a service? You know, and the ideas come that way and up and then it turns into a service. But without that literacy in place, that entrepreneurial aspect will also be missing. And uh, so there's, there's two reasons to want to increase yep. data literacy. I think the entrepreneurial part is, is harder because that's asking more of a person to be very creative and stuff. Uh, but. Uh, so maybe a lot of people think that uh, jumping ahead like that is, is difficult because it also asks a lot of your entrepreneurial capabilities, but increasing efficiency is all, also equally important. In I think you may have overcredited entrepreneurialism, by the way. Yeah. I think that 99% of entrepreneurialism is a small change to something that already exists. Yeah. Very few people wake up and say, I reject everything I've seen in the world, I'm going to go to something I'm in invent that's completely different. So I think in practice, the person that you just referred, referred to goes around and says, this is what we do, I saw that, can we try that small change? Will that make a difference? When it did, they'll try one more small change on top of that, and eventually someone will say, that's innovation. Yeah, yeah sure. most of the, I mean, I always say, combinations of data eat big, big data for breakfast. Like, interesting combinations that no one has ever seen mm -hmm. before, but that exists out there already, is usually where the exciting stuff happens. But to your point about like embedding it into the process, I think that's a huge piece right now. At Click, we like to talk a lot about active intelligence, uh, embedding you know, through things like alerting, uh, embedding into the moments and processes so that people don't have to go to a place to find stuff, but rather the data coming to you. Right. In the API economy, I think there's a lot of opportunities opening up in data coming to you, and that's going to lower the threshold for data literacy embedding it into the moments and the process, like you said. So that's yeah. the other aspect of it. Is this tools driven, would you say? I, I would say do the thing first and then add the tool, because I believe that if you, tr if you have a business process or you have a way of doing things that you think is right and that works for your organization and you have a need for data and you have the people finding a technology that can support that is easier than starting with a technology and then suddenly like, okay, now we have to retrofit everything else to fit the technology that we've invested millions in. So I would start with, with the data first and the questions you want to solve. Um, and you know, you mentioned something earlier where I thought, well, the people, you, you talked about curiosity. So many people in the business, especially those that have been there for a while, they might seem like they've given up on solving some of the problems, but if you give them a chance, you will see their eyes light up and be like, well, for the last five years, I've been thinking about a solution right. to this problem, and now that we have the tech, mm -hmm. I can do it, and they will blow you away, and their curiosity will be reinvigorated, and they will come to work excited mm -hmm. and kind of ready to go, and I think that's what we are seeing you know, with our technologies as well, that they give people that boost because it's something fresh, it's something that really fixes a large chunk of the problem mm. and they can spend so much more of their day doing the exciting stuff, the stuff that makes, like that uses our hu unique human capabilities that the machines will not replace. You know, our ability to combine and to like, yeah, yeah just solve these problems in our way and then, you know, use the technology to enable that. I think that's where the curiosity will be unstoppable. I think a simple question to ask yourself when you're buying the tool, how many people will use it? If the answer is this tool is designed for everybody to use it, you should buy it. Mm -hmm. If it is this small team of people is going to get a lot of value out of it, you better get an awful lot of value out of those small, that small group of people. Mm -hmm. In general, that's the way tech has gone. Everything that you're carrying around on that phone, the applications associated with it, those companies enabled things for everyday people. Mm -hmm. And if we're buying tools with that mindset, I think you can't, you, you generally won't go wrong. Right. But it is a change management exercise, oftentimes. So it's people, it's process, and it's technology. Right. And you need to make the sort of decisions simultaneously to get the best outcome. You can't rely just upon the people, you can't rely just upon the technology. So 
it's that combination. And, and not all technology was made to help. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of it is still designed very much for the technical community, not the rest of the business. Mm. And so you need to go into it with your eyes open about what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And Steve, you mentioned cycling earlier. Yeah. I think in the cycling community and with athletes in general, there's always the temptation of, oh, if I buy this, it's going to make me faster. But at the end of the day, it's still about the legs or the arms or whatever part of your body you use to move yourself forward. And I think with technology, it's the same. We, we get attracted to these shiny objects and we're like, oh, that's going to make the problem go away. It will help you make it go away, but you still have to do the work. And there are just tools, obviously, that make it easier, uh, but we can't underestimate how much of the human power it requires and the processes to optimize it. And you need the will, not yes. just the power, I think. Yeah. I was I was very curious about the anecdote you gave earlier about um, the um, decision maker that had uh, decided to uh, say that there was a value in the data as a strategic asset, and we had a conversation here earlier at the table about uh, you know how to quantify the value of the data. We talked about uh, quantifying it as a function of the turnover that some service that builds on that data uh, produces. Or, you know, there are other ways, you know, people value uh, logos and trademarks and that kind of stuff, so maybe there's that kind of... Have you had any experience with uh, the value of data? You, you guys have data inventory, so I think that would be also super interesting to hear. Uh, what have you heard about that? Um, well, as you mentioned earlier, there are some companies that have been built purely on data. Mm. That is their business. So you could say the whole value of the business is based upon the data that they have. Mm. I think it's a hard thing to do. I've not seen anybody really do it successfully, but I think people intuitively believe that there is value. I haven't seen anybody actually put a, an amount to it. Mm. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, infonomics is what you're talking about. Doug Laney wrote a book about it. Yeah. And it's, I, I, people are still dabbling around with trying to understand like how to actually measure the value of data because you can measure how many chairs and tables you have and in an organization and what the value is, but the data is, yeah. So fleeting and it's very tough to, to, to measure that. You could just say yeah. the, the entire market cap for Google is based on their data because they produce zero. Right. And they sell ads 100% based on the data they've collected yeah. and nothing more. Exactly. So, you know, for them, I think it's quite easy. Yeah. Right. That's the only thing an investor is buying into yeah. Yeah. at that point. I mean, if we can be creative enough to say what the value of the McDonald's logo is, I think we should be able to come up with some intangible ways of uh, creating or you know quantifying the value of data. Yeah. But I think one of the neat uh, initiatives that uh, Snowflake is working on is cataloging data and sharing it and that kind of thing. Is that uh, how do how do people perceive the value of that? Is that uh, do they see those data sets from a data scientist perspective? Many of the breakthroughs in science and data science in particular have happened precisely because somebody has released a data set. So you know, in vision, you'll get a great new data set and that makes a giant leap in science. And so it's obviously that that data set is valuable uh, in many ways. And so this cataloging that you guys are doing, how, how are you sort of positioning it? Yeah, so we've got the marketplace and it's basically where organizations can publish their data so they will uh, make data available in the marketplace for others to use either for free or for a commercial price uh, depending on what it is and there's data across various categories you know financial data weather data transport data uh, foot traffic all sorts of, of data that organizations can then use to enrich their own analyses and I think the value there's many aspects of it but for the data consumers the value is in getting data they've already used in the past, but in a much simpler way. So rather than going to a company's website and accessing data and downloading files and integrating it into your own workflow, making it available, you just have it in the same environment where you're already accessing your own data and you know, click of a button kind of, kind of thing. Um, and for the organizations offering the data, what has happened is that suddenly they're building a new revenue stream, some of them, because they're like, well, we hadn't thought of commercializing our data, but actually there's value in it and people want it, so maybe there's a new business model that's, in there. It's been a little bit of a dirty word, you know, monetizing the data, like. Well, I guess you could think about it as making it available in a more efficient way, because you don't have to put a price on it. You can make it available for free. Um, for, so for some organizations, it definitely is about monetization, and I think, that's fair enough, if it's always been their business, why not? And, and some are discovering that, and they move from being maybe a consulting business to suddenly being a data product business. Um, and then for other organizations, let's say the nonprofit sector or the public sector, 
if they want to collaborate, this is a great way for them to do that really effectively. So rather than sending things back and forth, they put it in one place for others to access and they might also make it available for organizations that are not in their immediate bubble, but who have a legitimate interest and who have the rights to access this data. So I'm thinking in particular in you know, healthcare research or life sciences, why, why not share it more widely with the research community to drive innovation and advances in medical yeah. research faster and further? I think we're seeing massive changes right now in what you're talking about. I mean, that actually changed society. Just look at open source intelligence communities. The Economist wrote about it, right? Mm. And every day you see Bellingcat publishing interesting photographs and different data points that uh, journalists and just general enthusiasts are looking at uh, and you know, perhaps identifying where an airplane has been shot down and things like that. So it's putting more eyeballs on the data that then innovate on the data basically. Or what we saw with the vaccine. I mean, it, it came, went from zero to, to having a, a vaccine on, on shelves in nine months because people started collaborating around data on a whole different level with small startups and academia and large organizations starting to share because they had to. Yeah. So they reduced those silos, they left their lawyers outside of the room and they just looked at the data and see what they could do together. So yeah. I think there's a huge untapped potential in, in having more people look at shared data basically. I wonder yeah. if there's a skepticism here because the, the early movers here are ones that are now the behemoths and uh, where you know it's there's personal data involved and monetizing that data has a sort of a negative ring to it but the, the legitimate use cases that are not selling personal data are far greater than that one niche of the early movers. Uh, even in hospitals there's great examples of using data of how personnel move around that doesn't have to do with sensitive patient data that you yeah. could potentially use for great, great things. I want to circle back now. We're, we have five minutes left, and I want to draw some neat conclusions here. And I actually want to ask you guys one of the questions that I've asked every panelist so far, and that is, is it better to move fast or is it better to move efficiently? So when it comes to changing data culture or changing data literacy in a company, is it better to move fast or is it better to move efficiently? Oh, that's a big question. Um, you can't say both. Yeah. That, <laughs> Which would, one do you prioritize? I would, I would say efficiently. I think uh, because you need to bring the whole organization with you, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so with support from senior executives and a groundswell of employees, you can get there. Doing that too fast, I don't know if you can bring the whole organization with you. So it's more about doing it well efficiently and well rather than too quickly okay in my view okay what fast you? fast 100 percent fast and the only time i would say not fast is if you look at your companies and i'm we're talking about enterprises here uh -huh. if you believe that there is more risk in your business than growth opportunity mm -hmm. then maybe you move and i wouldn't even use the word efficiently cautiously might be the better word mm -hmm. but fast every time fast always wins yeah yeah, yeah. I'd say it's important to move at all because it's very easy to just plan to move and not actually get off the starting line. Mm. Um, and I think it's good in the beginning to maybe you know take a few circular movements off, try, maybe it doesn't work, try yeah. something else. Because once you've found something that works, the, the speed will come anyway. You need that critical mass and it'll accelerate. So I would say in the beginning to test things out, try what works and then move forward. But Definitely, just start moving. Start moving, okay. I think exactly. for, <clears throat> excuse me, for data culture, it's fast because like decision velocity is so important and successful companies is like the aggregation of the number of decisions that are being taken. So like, if you can do that a little bit faster, that's going to have a huge impact on the, yeah. on the top line if you aggregate it together. For data literacy, I think you need to take it slow because that's a process that's going to be ongoing. It's a continuously ongoing cycle and one that never ends, and you should give it a lot of patience mm -hmm. before you see the impact, I think, in an organization. Mm. I definitely agree, you've got to get going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that you can do to achieve efficiency, even at an early stage, is to lean on the experience of others that have trod, trodden the same ground before you. So best practices, 
What would you say are best practices that you've either experienced yourselves or come across when it comes to affecting these change, changes in organizations? I think it comes back to that point, is starting somewhere, mm. making it successful, demonstrating it successful, showing some value to the business, mm. and then building out from there. People yeah. will follow. They'll see the value of it to the business. They'll, they'll see the value to themselves, and, and people will follow. Mm. So start small, get going. What do you say? I would say any, I would look for every piece of evidence where one organization does something in a way that restricts another organization. If I have access to data, you don't. If you have to ask me for something in a supply chain fashion rather than a collaboration fashion, ask for these are all reasons why businesses go too slow. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I'd say in terms of best practices around data culture, data literacy, I would start with people, because if you can identify some champions who are already passionate, they're already bought into this vision and the mm. change, they will take others along on the journey because it's much easier to believe your peers than to follow your boss, right? Okay. From an emotional perspective. So I would say empower those people, give them the autonomy to try things out, to drive the collaboration and to really have that as part of their job, not an additional initiative or yeah. an additional hobby um, and use those people to move forward. So that's great to hear to, that you, you champions would play a central role yeah. in that sort of trend. Do you all agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and what would you say are the best practices in transformation? So uh, <clears throat> I refer back to a model uh, on a blog I wrote a couple of years ago, which is Dalai, like Dalai Lama. Basically, look at the data. You know, the ongoing debate between self-service versus governance. Like, what's the right calibration for your organization? Mm -hmm. And what I call activists, which is how do we maintain and keep the best people in our organization? How do we keep them curious and challenged? Motivated. Yeah, motivated. And basically make them rock stars. Uh, you know, uh, lift them up as, as pillars. And then that will make more people want to become like them. And they can mentor these people. And that will drive like data literacy uh, initiatives in an organization. And then. Uh, data without applications is not worth a lot. So look at the different applications of data constantly, tie it to different business outcomes, but also organically let people experiment and prototype with, with applications. And then finally, capture the ideas in an organization that happen usually, like you said, uh, at the fringes of organizations. That's where much of this innovation is coming. So there should be a communication and collaboration path up to the enterprise. So those are the five pillars I usually talk about when, when talking about culture. Awesome. Thank you all for all your insights today. I hope the audience also felt that they got a lot of information out of this. And uh, hopefully, if you're here at the event, make sure to look everyone up. Otherwise, I think you, you're all uh, available through the ether. Um, we will be back shortly with a message from me and then a message from the chairman and a couple other messages. So uh, fill up the tea and the popcorn and uh, we'll be right back after this. Thanks everybody for joining. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.